So if a molecule is polar, it's, it's, well, it's going to attract. It doesn't always have to be polar, but there are three types of intermolecular force. Essentially, intermolecular force is the force that essentially causes the molecules to stick together. So if we have water, water is going to stick to another water molecule because of this thing called intermolecular forces. So the bond between two molecules is an intermolecular force. The bond inside of the molecule, which is your covalent bond, is your intramolecular force. So you've got intramolecular forces inside the molecule, intermolecular forces between the two molecules. So you've got your covalent bond and then you have the inter Now the intermolecular force is going to be one of these three types of forces, either dipole-dipole attractions, hydrogen bonding, or London dispersion forces. And the type is going to depend on the molecular polarity that we have. Okay, so let's take a look at the first type, which is dipole-dipole attractions. Okay. All right, so dipole-dipole attraction, what that means is that we're going to have a molecule that essentially has a dipole attraction inside of it, um, meaning that it has a positive and a negative side. So let's take the first example I have down here, and I'll explain what this all means. We have hydrogen and we have iodine. Okay, now In that hydrogen and iodine, in that molecule, we know that the iodine is going to pull electrons with a greater force. So what that means is I get a partial negative on the iodine and a partial positive on the, on the hydrogen. This is called a permanent dipole because this charge never changes. It's always negative on this side, always positive on this side. Since I'm talking about a permanent dipole moment, remember the dipole moment is the arrow that we draw in here. Okay, that's what the dipole moment is. So we're looking at a dipole moment that's always going to be here in this particular molecule, always pointing in this direction. So if I have another hydrogen iodide next to it, that hydrogen iodide is going to be attracted to itself, to, or attracted to another hydrogen iodide, due to the fact that this is partially positive and this is partially negative. You get an attraction between those two molecules, and that's what we call the intermolecular force. These are held together because of the positive and negative attraction forces that are on here. So the dipole moments are going to both point in the same direction. So if I drew a dipole moment here, it would point in this direction, the same as this one. And those are what are attracting each other. Okay. So the difference, obviously, if this were a bigger difference between the two atoms, like if I put a fluorine in here, well then the charge is going to get stronger and the attraction force is going to be even stronger. Okay, and it's this attraction force that keeps our substances now in the particular phase, like a solid, liquid, or gas. If we have a very strong attraction force, we tend to have more solids and liquids. If we have a very weak or almost negligible uh, intermolecular force, these particles tend to go in the gas phase. So we're going to see that boiling points and melting points can give us some insight into how strong these forces are. Okay, so first of all, in order for it to be a dipole-dipole attraction, meaning that two dipoles, dipole means that you have a positive and a negative charge, so that this molecule acts like a little tiny magnet. This one acts like a little tiny magnet as well. So anything that is dipole-dipole is going to be polar. So if it's a polar molecule, dipole-dipole attraction. It's that easy, that simple, okay? So if I have something like uh, the nitrogen and fluorine, well, I have nitrogen, I have fluorine, and if I look at this molecule, well, I know in three dimensions what I'm going to end up with if I try to draw the molecular geometry version of this. I have the fluorines down here, I have another fluorine here, and I have another fluorine down here at the bottom. So therefore, what's going to happen is the fluorines are all going to pull the electrons in this direction, in this direction, and in this direction. I'm going to end up with all the dipoles pointing down. And I'll show you this a little bit better in, the, in class uh, with positive, negative, oops, negative, and D. No, I did it again. Negative and negative. So what we can do here is we can split this molecule into two pieces and say that this molecule is polar. And since it's polar, this molecule is going to have a dipole-dipole attraction. That's what's holding two of these nitrogen trifluorides together. Okay? I'll show you at the end how I'm going to put this all together in, in one um, one little wrap up at the end. Okay, so here as I said before, we can use boiling points as a measure, right? We can look at boiling points and say, okay, we're looking at three these four compounds here. Boiling points um, are going from a, you've got a liquid, okay, and it's going into the gas phase, right? You're trying to produce this gas above your liquid. Well, in order to get that gas to come out, we need to break the bonds that are holding them together. There's a force, an intermolecular force, holding these two atoms together. Well, if I break that intermolecular force, then that gas particle here can go off into the gas phase, and then we can produce a gas. 
So the stronger that intermolecular force, the higher the boiling point. So if we look over here, these are four elements. This is polar, so this is going to be a dipole, dipole, polar, dipole, dipole, polar, dipole, dipole, polar, but look at the energy. I mean, look at this. Water should boil below zero. We should have water actually boiling somewhere in this region here, but water actually does something very strange and very different. It has to do with the fact that oxygen and hydrogen are right in a very good spot. The magnitude of the difference, if you look up the electronegativities between these two, it's going to be very, very high in polarity pulling towards that. This is going to be a very, very strong negative, very, very strong positive. So it makes like a very, very strong super magnet. This is what's referred to as hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a special type of dipole force that tends to be stronger than most dipole-dipole forces. When does this occur? Whenever you have the hydrogen atom bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Okay, So if you have hydrogen bonded to any of these three elements, you get what's called hydrogen bonding. And it just means that these elements here are such high electronegativity differences compared to hydrogen that it creates a super strong uh, attraction force between the hydrogen and the, um, or, you know, between the, the two molecules in the substance. So it's formed due to the difference in electronegativity of the nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, and this tends to be the strongest of all the hydrogen, of all the uh, um, intermolecular forces. Okay? All right. Again, I'll recap this and show you how I'm going to you'll figure this out as we look at some examples in just a minute. And I'll also go over this in class again just to make sure we get the, all your questions answered. All right, so London dispersion forces. This is the last one, and this is the one that's a little bit difficult for students to get, to get an idea because this is now an induced dipole. Remember before we talked about a permanent dipole? Well, in this one, we are going to create a dipole that's not normally there. This is for nonpolar molecules. Okay, so for nonpolar molecules, what you're going to end up with is London dispersion forces. Okay, <clears throat> so what happens? If we look at a little animation I'll show you in just a second. We know that certain things can go into the solid liquid gas phase, right? We, we can condense them down, solidify them. Why is it, how is it possible if something is nonpolar? Right? How can we get something like carbon dioxide, which is nonpolar, how can we get that into the, to the gas, from the gas phase? to a solid phase? Well, it's because of London dispersion forces. So let me show you some animation that might make, make it easier for you to understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so if we take a look here, what I have are two neon atoms. Okay, these two neon atoms are neutral, right? There has an equal number of protons as it does neutrons. So this is a neutral atom and a neutral atom. But watch what happens as these neon atoms start to come close together. Take a, these, by the way, these blue dots are the electrons, okay? And the electrons are always moving around, zigging, zagging, and they can't really say the where they are, you know, for sure. But take a look what happens. That as they get closer together, these electrons are going to start to do something. A negative charge slowly forms on this because the electrons are kind of being pushed away from each other, right? Electrons are starting to move in this direction away from each other, so we end up with a induced dipole. So we get a temporary shifting of electrons. Notice the electrons kind of shift over here, making it negative, making it exposing this side to be positive. Okay, so the electrons should be a little bit more over here because you got you know a couple more here. So what they're doing is they're repelling and pushing those electrons away and creating a temporary dipole. So notice the electrons here are being drawn over here and being pushed away. And as it happens, they create a positive and negative charge which attracts each other and creates that London dispersion force. Okay, and so you can see that that would go away. They would go back to normal. So as two neon atoms come up near each other this force is created and then it goes away. It's created and then it goes away. Okay, and that's an induced dipole. It's normally not there. It's a temporary dipole, unlike the uh, dipole-dipole forces which are always there. Okay, Okay. so as I said, uh, London dispersion forces are temporary forces. They're not there all the time. Uh, and the size really depends on the number of electrons. The more electrons it has, the stronger the London dispersion force. So one quick way to determine which one has more electrons is to figure out which one has a larger molar mass. Because if it has a larger molar mass, that means it has more protons and therefore more electrons and therefore a stronger induced dipole because there's more electrons to cause a disturbance or a distortion in the electron orbitals. Okay. So these are a little harder to explain. I know they're confusing to understand, but I can kind of get you at least um, how to figure out which is which. So let's take a look at that and end the video here with how do I know which intermolecular force to use? Because that's really where most of the questions are going to lie. First thing you want to do 
is you want to figure out is the molecule polar okay so first answer the question is it polar if it's nonpolar your answer is London dispersion forces okay so that's that's relatively simple if it's nonpolar the only explanation we can say that's holding those molecules together in the solid or, or liquid phase is a nonpolar London dispersion force all right now if the bond is polar you have to watch for hydrogen being bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, or I should say fluorine, nitrogen, oxygen. If you can say yes, that the hydrogen is bonded to one of those three elements, then you would say yes, hydrogen bonding is my intermolecular force. If there's no hydrogen, or there's no hydrogen bonded to the fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, you're going to say dipole, dipole forces. So if I were to say, okay, here we go, let's take a look at an example. If I have um, H2, Okay, first of all, is this polar? No, it is not polar. It's a nonpolar molecule. So therefore, what's holding it together? London dispersion forces. So we had LDF. I like to abbreviate that LDF. If you want to abbreviate LDF, that would be fine. Okay, LDF for London dispersion forces. If I had a molecule such as NH3, well, I'd have to figure out is it polar or nonpolar. Well, I draw the, the Lewis structure, and I find that there's a lone pair of electrons. So it's going to push the hydrogen down, hydrogen down, hydrogen down. I have what's called a trigonal pyramidal structure, right? Trigonal pyramidal. And therefore, since it's trigonal pyramidal, electrons are being pulled towards the nitrogen, pulled towards the nitrogen, pulled towards the nitrogen. And we saw this earlier. Negative, positive, positive, positive. So I can split this in half. I get a negative side and I get a positive side, this molecule is considered polar. So the overall molecular structure is polar. And then I ask myself, is hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, fluorine, or oxygen? Yes, nitrogen is bonded to hydrogen. So therefore, I would say that this is hydrogen bonding. Okay, and then if we have something like HBr, uh, okay, bonded to hydrogen and bromine, well, for hydrogen and bromine, there's going to be a difference in electronegativities. Electrons are being pulled towards the bromine, so I get a partial negative, partial positive. So I have a polar molecule. The question is, is there hydrogen bonded to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine? No. Therefore, I would say that this is a dipole, dipole, whoops, molecule. Okay, or dipole, dipole, inter, intermolecular force. So this one is dipole, dipole. Okay, and that's pretty much what we'll do. So, of course, I'm sure there's a lot of questions, and I'll answer them in class. So write them down, and I'll uh, talk to you guys tomorrow.